Today we're picking up with the early middle, medieval age or the early middle ages. And it's during this time period that we see the rise of Europe as a civilization. And what we're gonna see in the European civilizations are basically two major themes. The first is we're going to see the central role of Christianity and how it develops and how it spreads throughout the rest of the world. The second is we're going to be looking at the struggle for control of the dying Roman Empire. Rome was kind of on the outs, and so someone has to come in. It's kind of like a power vacuum. Someone has to come in and take over. So we're going to see who comes in, who's going to make um, the big decisions and takes over the old Roman territory. So we start out with the Middle Ages, and the early Middle Ages is roughly the time period between 500 to 1000 CE. Um, Europe at this time was kind of considered to be sort of a backwater region. Um, it was pretty isolated, although it was a land of very great potential. Uh, its location is really good. It's relatively small, so it's pretty easy to get across. It, it doesn't take a whole lot of time or effort to get across Europe, uh, but it has a lot of resources like forests and better soil. It has uh, really good mineral resources as well, and it has access to the seas, which is going to allow for trade and exploration and another source of food. So all of these things Europe has going for it to make um, a go of it. However, it doesn't always start out just real great. After the fall of the Roman Empire, we're going to see uh, the Dark Ages emerge in Europe and throughout the the, the continent of Europe. Um, it's called the Dark Ages not because it was dark. There was night and day just like normal. Um, it's called the Dark Ages because there's very little documentation about this time period. There's not a lot of literacy anywhere at this time period. Um, when the Romans kind of die out, so does literacy. So does being able to read and write. And so those who were able to read or write typically were involved in the church or they were the upper classes. It wasn't your your normal people that were able to, your average people who were able to read. Europe at, at this time is going to be divided up into small little kingdoms and the strongest one is going to be the Franks and the Franks are basically in the region of France at this time. Um, a strong king is going to emerge from the kingdom of the Franks, and that is Clovis, and he comes to power in 481 as king of the Franks, and he is going to convert to Christianity, and that is going to be a big deal that you get, you get the government behind Christianity, and that's going to help promote it. Well, he didn't start out as a Christian. He actually converts to Christianity. His wife uh, was a Christian, and she told him that if you convert, God will be on your side and protect you. Well, he was about to go into a major battle, so he said, fine, if I win the battle, then I will know that God wants your God wants me to convert to your religion, and I will convert if we win. So he goes out to this battle, and he wins, and so he becomes a Christian. And then he's going to get the backing after that. Um, after converting to Christianity, he gets the backing of the Roman Catholic Church, which was still around, even though the Romans weren't around, the Roman Catholic Church was still around. And he gets the backing of the Gauls. And the Gauls are another group from the French. Um, that It's another group of, or another kingdom. And they were highly religious, much more so religious than the kingdom of the Franks. So by Clovis converting to Christianity, he's going to kind of make friends with everybody else who's Christian and, and gain some allies that way. So the Dark Ages eventually go by the wayside. More and more prosperity comes to Europe and the Dark Ages kind of disappear. And we get the early Middle Ages. And it's during this time period that we get a very great king and his name is Charlemagne. And Charlemagne is the French form or the Frankish form form of Charles the Great. So Charlemagne just means Charles the Great uh, in the Frankish language. Uh, he is going to eventually create an empire and his empire will include France and Germany and parts of Italy. So you can see how he's chipping away at what the Romans used to have. He was a very impressive fi figure himself. He stood over six feet tall, which was kind of amazing at that time because most people weren't that tall. They were not they didn't, he, he literally stood head and shoulders above everyone, everyone else. 
He's also impressive as, as a king because he is in power for 46 years. So he is very long reigning. And so as a result, he's going to have a lot of things that he has to deal with. So he becomes, uh, he becomes king in 800 CE. Pope Leo III of the Roman Catholic Church is going to call on Charlemagne for help. He had some Roman tribes that were wandering around that were threatening the church, and he didn't like that. So he's going to call on Charlemagne to come down and help him out. Charlemagne does. He comes down, and he crushes this rebellion. And in return, the pope is going to procl proclaim him emperor because he came down and did this good deed. However, there's already a Roman emperor, and that emperor is in Constantinople. Remember, the Roman Empire split apart into a Western and Eastern, and the Eastern moved its capital to Constantinople. Um, and there was still a Roman emperor there, a Holy Roman Emperor. And so the Pope of the Roman Church in Rome is going to proclaim Charlemagne the Holy Roman Emperor, but we already had one. So what that's going to do is just widen the split between the Eastern and Western Christian worlds. They, they just don't quite get along even remotely the same after that. So uh, it does cause some issues, some problems. Charlemagne, however, becomes very well known as a king. He is very good at his job, which is why he keeps his job for 46 years. But his government is going to work very closely with the church and that's going to help spread Christianity throughout Europe. He also is going to appoint very powerful nobles to help rule his local regions. He knew he could not rule his entire empire himself because he can't be everywhere at once. So instead, he's going to um, give nobles this some land so that they could support Charlemagne and they could supply him with soldiers for his army. And so he gives them a little bit of power. This is another way for him to make sure that these nobles aren't going to rise up against him and, and assassinate him. So it, it kept the nobles happy, but it also kept um, Charlemagne happy as well. Now, there's some thoughts that maybe, you know, maybe he's not able to quite keep control. How does he know that they're not going to rise up against him? Well, what he's going to do is he's going to send out these messengers, and they're called Missi Dominici. And the Missi Dominici were... were apparently set out to you know check on the roads and listen to grievances and see that the justice of the king is being done but in reality they're kind of like spies they're spying on these nobles and making sure that they're not planning a rebellion or anything like that so kind of their front is that they're out to to do all this you know checking on how things are going when in reality they're kind of checking behind the scenes to see what's going on so anyway, so Charlemagne also is going to be will kind of usher in this revival of learning. Uh, he wants to make his cop his capital, which was at the city of Aachen, a second Rome. He wants to make it as glorious as Rome used to be. And so he's going to promote learning and he's going to promote education. So that's what really brings uh, Europe out of the Dark Ages is because Charlemagne really kind of pushed it out of the Dark Ages by... Um, promoting learning and education. And Charlemagne himself could read, but he couldn't write. He didn't know how to write. Um, and so from the reports that were sent to him, he saw that education, even from those who were supposed to be educated, like the clergy and the churches, seemed to be in decline. So he really wanted to promote this. And so he really started to begin questioning whether or not these clergymen who say they can read and write but really are doing kind of a, a really bad job of it, he questions whether or not they're interpreting the Bible correctly. And so he says, we really need to have people who know what they're doing when they read and write in order to read the Bible correctly so because otherwise we will miss out on God's word kind of thing. So he's going to set up a palace school at Aachen, which is his capital city, and he's going to put in place a curriculum of study based on Latin learning, like the Roman learning. So he really wants to bring back the, another Rome, the glory of Rome. And this curriculum of study included things like grammar and logic, so being able to logically think about things, arithmetic, geometry, um, as well as rhetoric. And rhetoric is knowing how to argue or how to speak. So that was an entire class. Was It's kind of like public speaking, sort of, in a way, except um, it, it includes more logical argument kind of things. Um, music, astronomy, those were all included in his curriculum. Uh, he also will have... Uh, a staff who is set aside just to copy down ancient manuscripts 
and that basically serves as textbooks for the next 700 years. These the the manuscripts that they save from the the library at Alexandria and from the Greeks and from the Romans, anything that they could find are going to be copied down and saved and preserved as sort of this ultimate learning and that's what you wanted to learn that's what you wanted to become like so the legacy of, of Charlemagne just like any other person he has to die eventually and he dies in 814 and his empire sort of falls apart after that um, his heirs which are the people who are supposed to come after him are gonna fight over his land for the next 30 years it's gonna be kind of chaos in 843, his grandsons will finally sign the Treaty of Verdun, and the Treaty of Verdun is going to split Charlemagne's empire into three different regions. So he doesn't even get to keep the entire empire together. Um, so it splits it up, and obviously they're, they're going to have some issues about, I want this little piece, and you want that little piece, and that kind of thing. So it, it, it never really kind of gains regains the glory of Charlemagne. Um, we'll see it a little bit later, but uh, they, they still kind of have these petty little fights. His legacy, however, Charlemagne does leave a very strong legacy after him. Um, he is going to extend the Christian civilization into northern uh, Europe by him converting to Christianity and being a Christian and, and getting the Holy Roman Emperor or Holy Roman Emperor title and and the blessing of the of the uh, Roman Catholic Church. That's all going to help spread the Christian civilization into Europe. He also helped to blend together the German and Roman and Christian traditions. So a lot of things that we take kind of for granted kind of started with Charlemagne. So things like having a Passover meal or the Easter meal or a Christmas meal and um, how we celebrate Christmas. A lot of those things came from this time period of Charlemagne. He also created a very strong and efficient government, which will serve as a model for later rulers. We're going to see some elements of that in later rulers as they come to power. They're going to kind of play on some of Charlemagne's ideas and try and improve upon them. But like I said, with the division of his empire into three, it kind of weakens it. And when it's weakened, there's going to be other groups that are looking in and saying, I want what you've got. And so we've got all these attacks on Europe. Uh, the Muslims are going to be coming in from, from the Middle East, and they will establish themselves in the island of Sicily, and they'll also establish themselves in Spain. The Magyars, which are a group from Hungary, they're going to overrun Eastern Europe, and they'll move in on parts of Germany and parts of France and um, Italy. And they kind of establish a presence there. In, in fact, it takes about 50 years before they get pushed back out um, and pushed back into Hungary. The Vikings, however, were the most destructive of those that were attacking Europe at this time. They were expert sailors who were coming from Scandinavia, which is like Norway and Sweden and Finland. And they are going to use the waterways. They're very good sailors, so why go across land if you don't have to? They're going to use their boats and go up the rivers and any access they can get. And they're going to loot and burn communities along these coastlines and rivers. And so they're stealing gold, they're taking slaves, all kinds of stuff. Um, anything that they could sell and, and fit in their boat, they're going to take, they're going to take off with. And so it's because of these threats that we're going to see a major change happen in Europe so that they find a way to make monarchies or the kings as a government work better.